today we're going to finish our series on healing. For the last three weeks we've been talking about healing and we've been answering some, some difficult questions about healing. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to stay with me and remember when we first, when we first started talking about it, I said there may be parts of of healing you may not agree with and so don't get angry if you disagree with the answer but we're gonna have grace and mercy throughout this process and and let me tell you God has been doing amazing things throughout the series last week you heard of just another of, of one of our healing miracles uh, that we prayed for in the first week and the question people normally have is does miracles do miracles actually happen and if they actually happen then why don't we see more miracles happen in America. So my question is, or the answer to that is, yes, miracles still happen. God has not changed. His power is still at work, and people are still being healed. They're still being delivered, and they're still being set free. We've had a number of powerful healings here and even on our other campuses. Listen, listen to some of these exciting stories at our North Little Rock campus. There's a woman by the name of Jody Weaver. She shared how all of the pain that she came to church with was gone. She posted this on Facebook. She said, one touch from God changes everything. I went down for prayer this morning, and God touched and healed my body. Every pain that I had in my body when I entered the building this morning was gone after prayer. Listen to this other one. Someone posted this. They said, I, I had someone pray over me. I've struggled with anxiety really bad for years. It's crippling. It hits me every morning hard. This morning I woke up with zero anxiety. Pastor Jason over at our Mejia campus in Texas, you're like, where's Mejia? Well, it's in Texas, somewhere in Texas. So uh, Mejia, Texas shared this. The first week in the series, we prayed for a woman who hadn't been able to hear, hear out of her left ear for several years. After, after prayer, she could hear me rubbing my fingers together about six inches from her ear. Others have shared about healing from sickness and pain, and, and you've been healed. And, and, and here's my question. If you've been healed throughout this series or throughout your lifetime, I want you to just do me a favor. Just stand up. Just stand up. If you've ever just been healed, you've experienced the healing, and when people go, do healings still happen? Well, look around you. Here are all the people standing, and I'm standing because I remember the moment that God healed me. So you guys can have a seat. Thank you so much. Man, so does God still heal? Yes, he does. Does he still heal in America? Well, he does. Why don't we see the miracles? Well, it's not that we don't see them. I don't think we, we really hear about the, the miracles. And there are several reasons. We live in an instant society. People move on quickly. They don't pause for anything. So, so they don't even think about it. They may, they may not be in pain anymore and just be like, oh, I'm just going to pick up and, and keep going. I'm not going to, I don't realize that I am not in pain anymore. See, we're inundated with by news and information. Miracles are shared, but guess what? You just don't see it because you, we've got hundreds of other stories that crowd them all out. Church services are shorter because people are less willing to give God their time. As a result, testimony time doesn't really happen anymore. Remember, it was a Sunday night service for us. It would be like, hey, who has a testimony? And like, you have like 50 people. And I remember as a kid sitting in that fourth row, I go, man, we never going to get out of here. Like, I'm like, man. And then like, then, you know, the pastor had a method. He, get, he, didn't, he never gave someone the microphone. He just held on to the microphone because he knew. S sometimes the testimony time, it would start of a testimony and then may go into rebuking at one point and then may come. Like, you knew the spouses that were fighting just from the testimony. Like, today my husband was not an idiot this morning. The Lord is a miracle worker. You're like, oh, man, like, they must be fighting. And then the husband comes up and you're like, oh, no, we're going to have an all-out brawl. But we used to have testimony time. And sometimes it was a little cringeworthy. But if you grew up in church, you might remember testimony time. Their pastor would ask, does anyone have it? We have it. People would share about all the different things. But testimony time was also messy. So it doesn't happen in church service anymore. But stories are still being shared all around in other churches and what God is doing. Finally, you don't hear about it because you don't share about it. You tend to diminish everyday miracles because they aren't spectacular, like someone coming back from the dead or the blind person that has been healed. There's no such thing as a little miracle. 
when God touches, it's a big deal. So here's another question. Why are some people healed when others aren't? Why isn't everyone healed? And this is a big question. This is a question where people start to get angry with God because of, of this. And I have to be honest with you. I, I don't know. I don't know why not everyone is healed. And, and ra- is, is, is rarely asked in a vacuum. And, and some people, it, it's usually asked with a specific person or even a situation in mind. Why wasn't my mom healed? Why am I not healed? I'm not going to give you a cliche answer. I'm not going to attempt to minimize your suffering by quoting a Bible verse out of context or or make it your, your own fault by questioning your faith. I'm sorry you're sick or even your mom who is hurting. And, and we're going to pray for your healing, although I don't know the answer to this question. But let me respond with some thought. First, we live in a sick world. Sickness, disease, and deaths are the result of sin. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. He says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sin. So Adam and Eve, they first sinned, creating a world ravaged by sin. You and I struggle with sin because of sin. And the result of physical life on earth is physical death on earth. And so here's the deal. We're all going to die. I'm going to die. And the process of dying is inevitable. Even the people Jesus raised from the dead, like Lazarus, guess what? Well, he died again later. So that doesn't mean every time you get sick, it's a punishment for a sin that you committed. Uh, sickness is not an, an, an indication that God is angry with you. Paul, Timothy, and, and Tromophilus, and Ephrodophilus, dietist, missionary. I don't know who made up these names. I'm sorry. I'm going to have a a problem with that. But they were missionaries and preachers in the early church. All struggled with illness, sickness, and in the result of living in the world being delivered by sin. Secondly, we have a very short view of sin, or of life. We mistakenly think that this is it. Well, this this is what we're living for. Good, healthy times on earth. Some believe that we're entitled to a certain number of years before slipping away in our sleep. But guess what? Life is in this world is temporary. Look at these scriptures in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. There is a time for everything and a season for everything. Activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. Hebrews 9, 27 says this. Just as man is destined to die once and after that face judgment. So when we are told God can heal, we're also told that We'll experience death. Death comes when your body has reached the end of its life because of deterioration or even disease. Third, God may be using your situation to further the gospel. Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. So Galatia was able to hear the gospel because of Paul's illness. See, God sees the, the bigger picture. His ways are above our ways, and, and you cannot possibly comprehend all that, that he knows and understands, but you can ensure this, that you have to view everything, including your lack of healing, through the lens of God's plan. I've seen God use sickness and suffering in people's lives to show faithfulness to God. I've seen sons and daughters accept Jesus because of their, their faith and, and, and their parent handling the suffering. In fact, I have a good friend that several years ago got diagnosed with brain cancer. Man, he was, he was, he's a doctor in, uh, in, in theology and all this stuff. A smart, smart man. One of my good friends. And several years ago, before, uh, about two years in, when we were in Illinois, he told us that he had brain cancer. And I thought, oh my goodness. So he had to have brain surgery. And in the process of this, what he was doing is... and. And he, was, he, was, he didn't know if he was ever going to make it out of the surgery. In fact, his kids were not even graduated high school yet. And he was, he was putting videos together of just in case I don't make it. And let me tell you, as he had his brain surgery, uh, they didn't get all of the cancer, but they got most of the cancer. And you know what? In that process, I learned a lot about God's healing. God's healing may not be it's all gone, but the all gone 
was in the, in the definition of what is called a stable disease. And I remember talking to him, and he's like, it may not be all gone, but it's called a stable disease, meaning it's not growing, it's not moving, it's just hanging out there. He goes, then that's a healing from God. It may still be there, but guess what? It's just a reminder of that God is stable in my life. And in that, I was like, oh my goodness, I never thought about that. But in that process they, of a Christian man, a pastor, people were judging him and saying, well, you don't have, a, you don't have enough faith. You have a lack of faith because it's not gone. But it wasn't moving. It wasn't growing. It was there. And now he's still alive. And he's still able to see his kids and see his kids get married. And so as we look at this, here's a question. And I don't think we realize sometimes. Jesus didn't heal everyone. So when Jesus walked on the earth, he didn't like just wave his hand and like everyone fell over and got healed. Not everyone got healed. And, and it, when we were in John chapter 5 verse 3, we talked about there was a great number of disabled people that used to lie the, used to lie, the blind man, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been the invalid for 38 years. So when Jesus saw him lying there and they learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? One guy was healed. The others weren't. But here we go. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with the word and healed all the sick. So we get Matthew chapter 12, verse 15. It says, Many followed him, and he healed all their sick. So I don't know why Jesus didn't heal everyone. I don't know why when you pray and ask for his healing that you're not healed, but I do know that God is good, and that we can trust his plan. So I pray for, for his purpose is accomplished through me, even through the pain that I may face. Here's another question. Why are some things that keep me from a miracle? What are some things that keep me from a miracle? Well, it usually it isn't always one thing, but God doesn't always stand in the way of a miracle or healing. A lot of times it's, it's us. We like to blame God for it, but really, it's us that get in the way. Now, I don't have a huge list, or I don't have enough time to give you a huge list, but here's the first one. Unbelief keeps us from moving forward. In Mark chapter 6, when Jesus returned to his hometown, he goes to his hometown. He goes to where he lived, where he grew up. He says he could not, he could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. So even Jesus couldn't heal everyone back at his hometown. So were they not all healed? Well, they weren't all healed because they didn't have, they had a lack of faith. And so as, as, as we talk about it, they didn't have a faith that Jesus was the Son of God. So regardless, the, the people's lack of belief limited Jesus to perform miracles. A lack of faith that trust creates an environment where miracles might not take place. Active, unconfessed sin can also be a barrier for your miracle. James chapter 5 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that they may be healed. We struggle with this thing called confessing our sins. Because our sin may not be affecting our outward appearance. So we can, we can make sure that we're all good. We can come to church and have this sin and know that no one else will know. But eventually, our sin will get out. Eventually, that sin will keep you from getting that miracle that you need. Active, unconfessed sin keeps you from what God has for you. How can you live in disobedience to God and at the same time expect and even demand his blessings and his healing? There's a lot of people that demand God to do things, but they're not doing what God has called them to do. There's, there's a lot of people that say, well, I need God to do X, Y, and Z. Guess what? You're not doing it anyways. You're not doing what he told you to do, so why is he going to do X, Y, and Z? Like, it'd be like, like asking your parents growing up, hey, I want to do this, and you can't do, you can't do the three things that they asked you to do. So, so why do we expect God to do something that God can do when we're not living the life that we should be living? We're doing the exact opposite. Are we going to reward our kids for their bad behavior and expect God to reward us for our bad behavior? It's not going to work like that way. 
But if there's any area in your life that you're living disobedience, it can be a hindrance to your healing. And if you're asking God for a miracle, well, it makes sense that we should obey him in, in your sexuality, in your finances, and in your habits. You want to reinstall some of these spiritual disciplines that you know are lacking because we got to do what is right. And some sicknesses and, and diseases are just because of a lifestyle of consequences, okay? If you filled your body with drugs for the last 10, 15 years, well, you're going to reap the, the consequences of living your life, uh, of, of doing lots of drugs. The natural consequences of poor health choices. If you fill your body with toxic things, it's going to lead to unhealthy choices and decay from your body. When my grandmother, she got diagnosed with lung cancer, I wasn't shocked she had lung cancer. She smoked like a chimney for years. So that was, that's what she got. She got lung cancer. So a lack of forgiveness and unresolved conflict. See, that's another barrier. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus taught on resolving conflict with a brother or sister. In Ma Matthew 18, 15, he says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Don't be blasting on Facebook. Don't go live and be like, let me tell you what this sucker did and do all this stuff. No, go to your, your brother, your sister. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or even three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen, even to the church, will treat him as you would a pagan or even a tax collector. It says in verse 18, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if you two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done to you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. So it's not, it's probably not coincidence that Jesus talked about, about answering prayer right after he talked about making relationships right. Here's another question. Can God use others in our healing? See, I see people decline, decline medical treatment saying that God will heal them in, instead. And here's another related question. Someone in my family believes that Christians shouldn't go to the doctors. Is going to a doctor or taking medication a lack of faith? Some people say that they're going to go to the doctor or take medicine and people go well that's a lack of faith if you trusted in god you wouldn't you wouldn't have to do that well if you really believed in god's healing you don't need the medicine well that's really a flawed logic now i know springtime is coming and guess what allergy season is upon us and i'm gonna sound like a mess i'm gonna have i'm gonna have runny nose sore throats i'm gonna do all this i'm gonna do a regiment of benadryl at night i'm gonna take a claritin in the day and i'm gonna do this every day from from march until may because i know it's bad but guess what i'm not i'm not claiming that god can't heal me in that process i'm just taking a medicine that's going to help in this process now if god in the in the in the, in the interim wants to take away my allergies well lord then take it away but what does the bible say you may say well that sounds good but what does the bible say it says this first timothy 5 23 says to make sure paul told timothy make sure that he took the necessary things to fight illness in colossians 4 14 we read that paul traveled with luke guess who luke was he was a physician he was a doctor so so why would god put paul with a physician uh if if god can just heal anyways right why would they need physicians but with everything paul went through he went through stoning beatings and imprisonment god provided a faithful friend who was a physician if paul could see a physician guess what then you can see a physician it's okay to take medicine it doesn't claim that you're not claiming that god can't heal you but you're going to take medicine just to help you whatever it is if you're homeschooling your kid i'm pretty sure you wouldn't just say okay lord give me all the wisdom and i'm gonna teach it to my kids i'm pretty sure you get books from other people get other things to help you with that you get textbooks resources written by trusted experts so if if no one says well that's just a lack of faith to get an education after you prayed for wisdom no they would say that's smart to do that right 
We believe God will provide what we need. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us our daily bread, but, but we still go to Walmart or Kroger's to buy food. Is that a lack of faith then? I mean, no, it's just providing food because last time I checked, is God, now if God wants to drop food at my doorstep, I'll be okay with it. But guess what? There, we got to go grocery shopping too. That's not a lack of faith in who God is. That's just, that's just being smart and getting food for your family. See, people have a tendency to change their theology. They talk big when it talks about your healing. You may come up here for healing. You're like, well, I'll tell you why you're not being healed. And they just go through this list. But then when they get sick, guess what? Their theology all of a sudden changes. They go, man, I'm going to go to the doctors. I'm going to go do my medicine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat better. I'm going to do all these things that the doctor has told me. Because that's what I'm depending on for my healing. People's theology changes all the time. Here's another question. How do you restore your faith? after praying so hard for a loved one that died in the spite of those prayers. This, was, this one's a hard one because uh, we, I had a friend of mine whose, whose dad got sick when I was in high school, and people prophesied, and they said, oh, he's not going to die. He, I mean, he had cancer, and they're like, he's going to be healed. He, he died, and it was like, oh, man, like, like what do you do? And, and this is hard to lose someone. It's hard to lose someone you love. You desperately want them to be healed and to stay with you, but you realize your grief isn't for them. It's really, it's for you. You're suffering real pain, and you, and you lost, and, you, and you've had a loss, but your loved one isn't petitioning God to let them return to earth. They are healed, they're whole in the presence of Jesus. And so losing your faith, well, it doesn't honor, it doesn't, doesn't honor their faith. Walking away from God is, is walking away from, from the God that they love, they served and are currently with. And, and remember, life is temporary. We all die, but we also get to live again in the presence of Jesus. And so that's why heaven is referred to as the blessed hope. It's hope beyond this life. And there's two important components to this equation. Number one, faith is confidence in God's ability. Trust is confidence in God's agenda. We have faith that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even imagine. We trust that he knows what is right and best. One of, the, one of our dear saints, uh, I guess it was a couple years ago now, uh, Miss Connie, she, she got cancer, and, and she was a believer in the Lord. And I just remember sitting by her bedside before she passed away. She said, you know what? If God heals me, man, praise the Lord. But if God takes me home, well, praise the Lord, because I'll be with him again. And I thought, man, and me and my wife, we were talking outside. We're like, wow, like as she's facing this, she had the confidence of the uh, knowing that her life is uncertain. She's going to be somewhere else. She's going to be with Jesus. And so we have faith that God can deliver us from our afflictions. We trust that these light momentary afflictions are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed on us so we have the faith that this earthly body today is going to be healed we trust that one day that we'll have the body that is in perfect and glory and let me tell you when i get that perfect glory body man it's going to be it's going to be on because i'm going to be i'm going to be ripped i'm going to be walking around i'm going to be like hey everyone where's the weight room at i'll be like i'll be like woo! i'll be i'll be i'll be running around without getting out of breath and we'll be like it'll be awesome okay it's going to be awesome i can eat any mcdonald's cheeseburgers and not gain a pound i'm pretty excited about that i'll be like give me like five or six because i don't know what they do to them cheeseburger i know it's not the best cheeseburger but guess what it's okay for one dollar okay but faith knows that god is able but trust knows that god is dependable and so in faith we pray that we are healed and trust we look forward to the day when we're all together in god's presence and when your faith is low guess what you can still trust god and so we got to choose to trust. Now, I don't want to devalue your grief. Losing a spouse, a parent, a child, or a close friend is, is devastating. And sometimes it seems like a cop-out to say, well, guess what? They received their blessing in heaven. In fact, I mean, it's true, but it's not always helpful at the time. 
I often hear people say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to write down all the questions that I have for God and ask them all the questions you have for God. But guess what? You may as well just give up on that. You're not going to care about Some of you guys are going to be like, "Woo! I barely made it. Hallelujah. You're not going to ask any questions. <laughs> you, you're not going to ask any questions. You're going to be like, oh, thank the Lord. By the skin of my teeth, I'm here. I'm going to worship God. So all the questions that you have, they're, they're out the window, okay? Just, just write them down now. Maybe ask him in like two weeks or something. But you're not going to worry about it. Because you're going to be worshiping him. Trust that your loved one is in heaven. And that one day soon you'll join them in the presence of Jesus. And there's an old song that says, Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. And it is and it will be. Here's your last question. If there's so much we don't know about healing. And we, we, we may have never been healed on the side of heaven. What is the point of even asking God to be healed? Here's a short answer. The Bible tells us to. The Bible tells us for a good reason. It says, humble, humbly bringing your request before God reminds you that he is our source. He is trustworthy and he loves you. And so when we bring our request before God in, in a corporate setting, those effects are multiplied as we invite our faith community to participate, not only in a miracle, but also in our lives. And so this morning, as our, as our uh, worship team comes forward, we're going to continue to pray for God's healing in our lives. And so this morning, if you're here and you say, you know what, I need God's healing touch, we're going to pray for you. If you're here and you say, you know what, I have a friend that needs healing, I want you to come and, and we're going to pray for them. So to this morning, we're going to pray, we're going we're gonna to anoint our heads with, with your heads with oil, and we're going to pray because we believe that God wants to do something today. And so as our... So I'm just going to just tell you, if, if you want prayer this morning, I want you just to come forward right now. Just come forward, and what we're going to do is we're going to pray. People say, well, well, I don't want to come forward. Well, come forward because we're going we're gonna to pray and believe that God has something for you today. So if you know someone who needs a healing, if you want to be healed, or if you're just battling with, with maybe just things, uh, questions that you may have, I want you just to come forward, and we're going to pray. As our prayer team, I want our prayer team to come and, and pray for those.